Hi, I'm Dave Eckert, and this week I'm back in one of my favorite places on the planet, the Napa Valley. I love scallions for garnish. Napa has it all, including great dining at restaurants like Cindy Paulson's Go Fish. Oh, it was kind of brave, maybe a little foolish, but kind of brave and fun. And it was what I wanted to eat, and I've lived here since 1979. And Ken Frank's La Toque. This is two things. It's a chef's restaurant, and it's a chef who loves wine. Of course, what Napa is best known for is wine. I'll introduce you to one of my longtime favorites, Cosentino. Flavor and balance is what I'm looking for. Uh, I, I want the wines to be compatible with, you know, cuisine, fine cuisine, and I want them to uh, uh, to have the ability to age. And a new discovery, Palmez Vineyards. You know, we feel that uh, we are creating a good legacy here. A good legacy and great wine. Wining, dining, and reclining, Napa style. Culinary Travels with Dave Eckert is next. Harvest time in Napa Valley can't think of a better time to come to this terrific destination. The vineyards are ripe for the picking, the winemakers are primed and ready to go, and the juice, both grapes and adrenaline, is definitely flowing. On this morning, I'm at the crush pad of Cosentino, as in Mitch Cosentino, longtime Napa Valley winemaker, producer of some of my favorite wines in the valley, and a man who started as a wine salesman in Modesto. I didn't know much about wine, but certainly knew how to sell. Uh, and it uh, didn't take him long before he was the number one salesman and figured that, uh, you know, he had a, a knack for this sort of wine business. And uh, it didn't take long before some of these great wine winemakers uh, out in that area were calling him into blending sessions. And uh, he, uh, he really got into it and, and decided, wow, you know what? I, I can make wines like, like this, and uh, the, yeah, the very first wine that he ever made literally was in his kitchen, and he entered it into a, a national competition and uh, won Best Cabernet Made in America. Mitch has made a lot of Cabernets and a host of other wines since then, most here at his winery in the heart of the Napa Valley. On this day, they were crushing some Semillon that had arrived from the Pope Valley. It's late for Semillon to be arriving, but this whole vintage, the harvest of 2010, is late. You'll find a lot of sunburned grapes because leaves were removed to ripen the bunches during a cool summer when the heat finally arrived. For Cosentino and others, it's a challenging year. Yeah, selectively pick, so you're, you know, you reduce your harvest by quite a bit. And uh, now you're, you know, you've got to get your picking clean so you don't end up with a lot of, you know, a lot of burnt stuff in, in what you're doing. By Napa standards, Cosentino doesn't own a lot of vineyards, but he sources all sorts of grapes from all sorts of places. He enjoys many long-term relationships and the ability to work with a variety of grapes. I'm looking for consistency of, of, of growth, I mean, uh, and development of the vineyard and, uh, and flavors, you know. I mean, uh, if it's somebody new, like we, uh, this afternoon, I've got a new Merlot block coming in that I'm very excited about because in the vineyard the flavors are fabulous. So, uh, but I've never worked with the fruit before. So it's really gonna be a test. It's gonna be a, an interesting test year for this particular block. And if we like it, then it'll be something that hopefully we'll, we'll keep for the long term. I got the chance to see some of the grapes Cosentino works with on a long-term basis. This is the Estate Merlot, which also includes a small lot of Cabernet, known as the Secret Clone, because its origins are somewhat hazy. The clone produces smaller berries, which means more intense flavors and aromas. Cosentino says it should be a keeper. The one thing I love about this, this clone is that it has a different acid profile than most Cabernet. Meaning? 
Well, it's going to show in the finished wine. It tends to show a little bit more citrus in the in a, in a subtext kind of way on uh, in the palate, and which gives it an inherent brightness and and and, and shine and sh makes the wine shine a little bit more. It'd so, still be pretty exotic. Cosentino wasn't expecting a crop this year, but they got one, and he's excited about it. Maybe this clone won't be secret much longer. From the vineyards to the winery, sounds like a good time to taste some of Mitch's work. So into the barrel room we went with two of the secret clone line of wines, a Chardonnay and a Cabernet. The Chardonnay was first, and it was excellent. Great right. acidity on the, the finish. The acidity's great. Really nice, bracing acidity. Right. Focused and, wine. And yet the wine still has a lot of power, yeah. a lot of richness to it. The Cab came next, and it was equally impressive. This was what we call the $100,000 wine because the initial time that this was at the Napa Valley Wine Auction, a four barrel collection, a four bottle collection, 750, 153 liter, six liter, sold for uh, $100,000. I like it. Never been tasted by anybody before other than at the barrel tasting prior to that. I like it. I just don't think I like it that much. <laughs> <laughs> One thing's for sure I do love Cosentino wine. The right restaurant in the right hotel with the right synergy is a very good thing. And it's something that we're working hard on here and making good progress on. That's Ken Frank, chef and owner of Napa's La Toque restaurant, located in the Western Verasa. I filmed with Frank when he was in LA almost 15 years ago. It's taken me that long to hook up with him again. It was worth the wait. La Toque is awesome. And after 10 years in Rutherford, it has definitely found its home in Napa. There's things to do. There's bars open late. There's restaurants open late. There's as many good restaurants in Napa now as anywhere else you go in Napa Valley. And for a sleepy little town of 75,000, you know, we've got a couple of Michelin stars. We've got eight restaurants that anybody would be happy to eat in anywhere. So it's a, it's a, it's a good place to be. Good fit for you. Perfect. Pairing wine and food is a big part of the dining experience at Latoque. So when we asked Ken if he'd be willing to craft a couple of dishes to match to Cosentino wine, he was all over it. First came pan-seared skate wing with Azante currant, toasted pine nuts, lemon juice, and grapes. The dish was the perfect weight for the Cosentino novelist, a blend of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. The second dish was prime beef with cheddar pearl tapioca in a Rutherford red wine sauce. Sounds like a full-bodied red wine dish to me, so how about the Cosentino Meritage, a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot? It was perfect with the beef. The wines of Cosentino, the cuisine of Latoque. What could possibly be wrong with that? This is two things. It's a chef's restaurant and it's a chef who loves wine. So the menu is utterly seasonal, and we have two formats. We have a vegetable tasting menu and a chef's table tasting menu, and then we have what we call our options menu, where you put together your own tasting, and there's typically about 16 items there organized into three groups, some first courses that are obvious first courses, some things that really fit right in the middle that go with... And you literally label it that way. I love li that. Things literally. that go well in between. Well, it's a progression of flavors, and the first ones tend to go with lighter, brighter wines. The second grouping tends to go with a little richer wines, often white wines or Pinot Noirs or Nebbiolo-based wines that are thin-skinned red varietals. And then at the fourth or at, at, the, at the main course chunk, then you're looking at four options that go with big Napa Valley red wine. That's why people come here. No doubt Cosentino's wines go great with fine cuisine like that of Latoque. And that's one of the key elements Mitch looks for in any wine he makes. Flavor and balance is what I'm looking for. Uh, I, I want the wines to be compatible with, you know, cuisine, fine cuisine, and I want them to uh, uh, to have the ability to age. I want them to. I want. I want the wines, to, and I expect the wines to drink well when we release them, but to continue to improve for many, many, many years. You'll find Cosentino on Highway 29, adjacent to the famed restaurant Mustard's Grill. Fitting that my next destination is a sister restaurant to Mustard's, St. Helena's Excellent Go Fish, another jewel in the restaurant crown of Cindy Paulson. So did you know, like as a child growing up, were you attracted to cooking and cuisine? Did you kind of know you were gonna go that route? I was eight when my older brother married and she took me out and taught me how to do Mexican food, which was very rare for people in Minnesota back those days. And I really loved cooking. And I'd already been helping mom in the kitchen because if you help mom in the kitchen, you didn't have to do dishes. So I think Smart. part of my uh, love of cooking came from my hatred of doing dishes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I doubt Paulson does many dishes these days either, but she generates plenty of plates at her restaurant empire. I had dined at Mustard's Grill several times, but never go fish, which I really enjoy, both the cuisine and the ambiance. Go Fish is a large open space with lots of seafood themed decor. As for the cuisine, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Go Fish is all about seafood. This morning we're going to make the um, miso marinade cod. We marinate miso, it's black cod, and we marinate it for about three days in a yellow miso marinade, and then we simply broil it in the salamander. We have this really nice rice cake that's um, Japanese rice, and it's pressed with shiitake mushrooms and, and edamame, the beans and then it'll get fried and crispy on the outside, and then I'm making a wonderful broth with miso, I mean, not miso, um, mushroom broth. Paulson says this is one of the restaurant's most popular dishes, selling several hundred a month. I originally thought three days of miso marinade might be too much, but boy was I wrong. The dish is both beautifully adorned and beautifully balanced. The mushroom broth is a personal favorite. Go Fish also sports an excellent sushi bar. I ought to know, I had the yellowtail sashimi twice over two days. For the camera, there was the sashimi platter, featuring tuna, yellowtail, red snapper, and salmon. And we grow mostly experimental things in our garden because you can buy the other things on produce markets, so we try and grow the stuff that you can't. Like all good chefs, Paulson emphasizes fresh and local whenever possible. That includes the incredibly fresh and undeniably local herbs and vegetables she grows in her garden in back of the restaurant, like these tiger eye chilies from India. Usually because they're so small you can't we lose them whole because you can't take the seeds out and then you can't touch your face or your hands or anything. So we just use them whole and then pick them out they season a dish. Sometimes we'll take a little tiny slice with a thin knife and then that releases the inner juices and then you just take it out at the end. Paulson was a little reticent to show me the garden as it was toward the end of the season. But being from the Midwest it still looked pretty good to me. Not surprising as everything's good at Go Fish. And I've always had in the back of my mind this idea that I could do a fish restaurant that was, you know, West Coast Fish Seafood House, and then a great sushi bar, and some Japanese influence in the menu. And Ken said, yeah, great, and it kind of clicked. We hardly even knew each other, and we just put it together and did it. It must have been a fairly unique concept, um, the idea of, uh, of opening a, you know, almost exclusive seafood slash sushi restaurant in the heart of the Napa Valley, which is Cabernet country. I know, it was kind of brave. Maybe a little foolish, but kind of brave and fun. And it was what I wanted to eat, and I've lived here since 1979. And I know that there's people, we have regular customers right from the get-go, so I know it hit with a lot of people, and it didn't take us long to figure out what was missing, and we added our steak section on the menu. And right away, yeah. you, you realize. Yeah. There are people who are okay. just not gonna eat seafood. Yeah, no, and they don't want just a braised beef dish. So, it was fun. And they did it well. Whatever your choice, trust me, you will not be disappointed at Go Fish. It's time for me to travel down Valley, just a little east of the city of Napa, to Palmas Vineyards, one of the more striking properties you are likely to visit. We are from Argentina. We came here in, in 77, and nothing to do with winemaking. My husband is a doctor, and he came here because he wanted to do basic research. and. Uh, happens to be that the place where he was offered the position was at the was a combination program between um, UCSF and UC Davis. So we decided to actually live in Walnut Creek that was kind of, you know, between the two places. And that's how we became so acquainted with the valley because this was pretty much our backyard at that time. Amelia and her husband, Julio, fell in love with Napa and began dreaming of owning a winery here. That dream became reality when they happened upon an abandoned winery and vineyard at the foot of Mount George in East Napa. The winery and vineyard, originally known as Cedar Knoll, was founded in 1881, but Prohibition killed it and the property lay fallow for nearly 80 years. That's when the Palmases arrived. It took a lot of time, money and work, 10 years worth, but eventually their dream of a Napa Valley winery came true with Palmas Vineyards. The idea was to make wine and to have a little vineyard and been able to, you know, fulfill our dream of doing something that uh, that was going to be uh, rewarding for the family. We had two, I mean, two goals. One was to be able to fulfill our dream of making wine, 
But the second and probably the most important one was to be able to bring the family on board. What is absolutely true <laughs> is pleasure. that by about this time, we are we drinking. To some wine. Wine. <laughs> All of the Palmases are involved in the winery. Mother, father, son, daughter, and daughter-in-law. Yeah. Okay, and they are divine with wine. <laughs> I got the chance to meet them all during the course of our filming and even break a little bread, homemade empanadas, and drink some wine on the terrace overlooking the vineyards. And I got the chance to learn about those vineyards from Christian Gaston Balmas. The soils here are amazingly different as you kind of transition from the valley floor up into the base of, base of the mountain and of course on top of the mountain, it's like a totally different world up there. The, um, you know, we, the terroir changes constantly and they have all these very uniquely uh, plotted areas, these parcels, and they're, they're, we farm them completely different. You know, so the, the way you, you treat each of these areas, the, the, the way the water moves through the soil, the kind of minerals that are in the soil, the, 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 the fertileness, its ability to, to retain nutrients is completely different from each of these little areas. That means you're not farming a vineyard, but dozens of different vineyards. Add to that the fact that each year is different and you've got a very complex vineyard operation. Palma has taken some extraordinary steps to best deal with the vineyards, including extremely specific monitoring of how the vines are handling water. Once you know how the hydrology is, then the way you irrigate, the way you actually lay the water out on the vineyard is optimized literally every day. Uh, we, use, we do that using specific uh, different rows of, of emitters in the irrigation, and we can deposit water uh, on a per vine base basis depending on what that particular vine needs. So within this little area that we have predetermined for that year, we'll do our best to make sure that every vine is sort of on track with the one next to it. So really having a vineyard that's in balance, is that, is that fair Absolutely. to say? Absolutely, that's a great word to, to use, yeah. With all the diversity in the soil, the grapes mature at different rates. That means they can be picking in the vineyards for four or five weeks as each individual lot ripens. It's a lot of work, but it's the right way to do things. It all began when the Palmeses purchased the property and replanted the vineyards. When my father was planting this, you know, 14 years ago, they did probably, probably on the order of a couple thousand core samples to understand all these soil changes. And it took, it took a lot of sort of geoscience understanding to be able to come in and identify the proper rootstocks to use. And uh, here, 14 years later, uh, we're further optimizing that. You know, there's more rootstocks available and there's more that can be done to get even more quality out of these out of these soils as we continue to understand them a little better. Christian calls it challenging, but definitely worth the challenge. Back at the winery there was much more to learn and see. This is an amazing place, a gravity flow winery on four levels. This is a, fundamentally as gravity flow as you can get. Uh, the winery was built into the side of the mountain mainly because we had very little plantable land in the entire property. Uh, so we wanted to maximize our potential vineyards by not taking up acreage in the building. So we came underground. And instead of just building one cave, we decided to integrate as much gravity flow and to be as gentle to the grapes and the juice and the wine as possible by building actually four caves stacked on top of themselves. So at the top, we come with the grapes uh, each day's harvest. And because the, vi the vineyards are so topographically varied, as you saw with my brother, uh, we ha end up harvesting very small sections at a time. And so we end up having to also ferment very small sections at a time. So this winery is really designed to be able to take each one of those unique facets of the vineyard and harness them to be uh, the best that each location can be in, in the winery and the fermentation. The grapes move from the top to the bottom of the winery in stages of crushing, fermentation, and eventually barrel aging. The veranda of uh, grape sorting, and then the carousel of fermentation tanks, the press, the settling tanks that we then we also use for blending, and then here, this is a big wagon wheel of barrel storage. Uh, and the design was made into circles so that we can always be equidistant to all barrels. The idea is to be as gentle with the grapes as possible. Florencia believes, and I concur, that you can taste that philosophy in the finished product. I mean, ultimately, what we're really doing is expressing our, our, our land. And uh, this vineyard site makes very delicate wines. 
So the gravity flow winemaking allows us to harness that delicacy and really express it in the best way possible. And the best way to confirm that is to taste the wine. I do have a tough job, don't I? Palmez Vineyards is known for its elegant, silky Cabernet Sauvignons. So imagine my delight when I got to try two different vintages, an 07 and an 06. The first, the 06, was a bit more perfumed. You know, it's layered. There, there, there's a lot going on there. It's very complex. Uh, it's not a, um, you know, just a massive hit you over the head. Yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon, it's really yeah. got some style and class to it. Thank you. Really nice. Thank you. The second, the 07, was a little more powerful, but stylistically, very similar. I think, I think this one is a little bit more forward. Mm -hmm. This one is a little bit more ref, uh, just restrained a little mm -hmm. bit, but I would have a tough time choosing between the two. <laughs> They're really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Delicious wines from estate vineyards made in a winery you will not soon forget. Palmez Vineyards, a family statement. It is, it is very magic to actually, you know, work with your children. You know, it's actually very, very special. So it's, I think it's the, it's the nicest thing that you can do as a family is to be able to have, you know, every member of the family involved in what you're doing. You know. And with the same amount of passion because uh, that's also quite important. And we've been, that respect, been very blessed because the children... They have the same amount of love for what we're doing that, like we have, you know. So, you know, we feel that uh, we are creating a good legacy here. Palmez Vineyards, a story worth telling and wines worth seeking out. On that note, it's time for me to end my exploration of the Napa Valley and this week's show. As always, as I say goodbye for another week, no matter where you go or what you eat or drink, may your dining experiences be great and your travels safe. Hope to catch you again very soon on the Culinary Travels Trail. See you next week.